Okay, tonight, Psalm 110, I've, uh, I've given this um, a title just because I've titled all the others, but I'm not really satisfied with it. Go, the king is a priest. And the reason I titled it that is one of the greatest um, concepts in this uh, psalm is uh, very important to us as Christians, and that is the priesthood of the Messiah, the priesthood of Christ. And he is a uh, very unique priest for us. And that's that's mentioned in this psalm. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, this, this psalm is about war. It is about war. In fact, it's specifically about the last battle to be fought in the last war. And, uh, you know, that makes it kind of timely, right? We're all into war these days. War is on television. Um, this war is going to be something else entirely. So even though I've called this the, uh, the king as a priest, um, there's a lot going on here. This psalm centers around, um, some say two, I'm going to say three uh, divine, in other words, from God, oracles. And I'm using the word oracle in the older sense. An oracle can refer to a person that gives a message, but it can also refer to the message itself. And that's the sense in which I'm using it. And typically an oracle is a message that is a little confusing, a little hard to understand. And we have that in the psalm. But when you leave tonight, you're going to understand. So it's, it's only an oracle for the next few minutes, and it's going to be totally illuminated by my teaching. I'm kidding, but um, I'm going to do the best I can. Just a reminder where we are. We're in the royal psalms. And after tonight, it'll be abundantly clear. The only thing tying these together is the fact that they have to do with the king. And that's pretty much it. We, we're all over the place in terms of topic. We've seen coronation. We've seen sin. We've seen, and we'll see here tonight, war. Uh, so many different things, but all dealing with the king. And so as we get into this, we'll see a little bit of that. This one is problematic, this particular Psalm 110. Most certainly written by David. We know that for a fact because Jesus said it. All right? That's about as good a testimony as you can get. Uh, this, in fact, this very first verse of this psalm is quoted in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Uh, it's quoted in the book of Acts. It's quoted in Hebrews. Uh, so you don't want to miss this first verse. You can take a nap after, but don't miss the first one. It's so critically important, and we'll get to it here. Forthwith. So the first oracle, it's longer than this, but I just chose the uh, action verb here. Sit. Sit. Verse one, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. We do not know the occasion for which David wrote this. We only know that he wrote it. And right off the very start, we, we have this conversation being overheard, I, I assume, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the person that's not in this conversation is the one doing the writing. David is hearing, the Lord says to my Lord. And we got to, you'll notice the first Lord in this version is in all caps. That's something translators do to cue us in that the name of God, this right here, we transliterate it Yahweh. This is it in Hebrew. The name of God. Whenever you see all caps in the Hebrew, this is what appears. Yahweh. But the second use of the word Lord is not in all caps. And it's because it's a different word. It's Adon or Adonai. You've probably heard. Adonai is a fairly generic word. It can mean master. Uh, the, the man running the plantation might be an Adonai. The vineyard, he might be an Adonai. He might be a lord of the manor, the lord of the vineyard. But when it's used in a particular context, it can also refer to God. And so in this particular verse, let me back up there, the Lord says to my Lord, contextually, it becomes very clear what, what he's talking about, and by the context, I mean the rest of the entire psalm. You see it, but take my word from it. We're talking about the Father talking to 
the Messiah. Okay, this is a son of David. Now, what makes this so unique is that David is writing this. And so how does he refer to Adonai, my Adonai? David is the king. David is the king. So he's saying, my God said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The word, the, uh, the first verb there says, the Lord says, is naum, and it is a word often used to, uh, to lead into an oracle or a revelation in Scripture. This particular re re uh, revelation is that the Father says, sit here until a certain time. At which point you're going to make your enemies your footstool. This is a matter of subjugation. And go ahead and picture this. Picture a man sitting on the throne and where is he propping his feet? On the backs of his enemies. So, the, so God in heaven, the Father in heaven tells the Messiah, you're going to sit at my right hand until an appointed time, in which case I'm going to send you out to totally subjugate your enemies. Okay, we're already talking war. Mike? I just, just is still a little confused on the parties to this. So, my, who is, my, who is uttering that? Is it the hearer of this the, conversation? The writer of the psalm, we're taking it that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is the revelation that he has heard. So it's as if he's listening to a conversation between the Father, the first Lord, and the Messiah, Jesus, the second Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, and the reason he puts the personal pronoun there is he's referencing that positionally the Messiah is greater than the King of Israel. So God in heaven says to the, the one who is my master, says the King of Israel, sit at my right hand. So who sits at the right hand of the Father? The Messiah sits at the right hand of the Father until I send you out. It'll be clear as we go farther along. So what's David's role in this again? He, he's the one that's writing. So, so David, David is, my is... David's the one saying, my Lord. And so my Lord refers to... So there's some kind of distinction between God and the Messiah here that David is aware of. Well, <laughs> yes, yeah, but we have to, we can't, we don't want to put a full understanding in David's mind right. of the distinction between the Father and the Messiah. Only to say this, the Messiah is not the Father. Now, did David have a full understanding that the Messiah was the second person of the Trinity? That's an idea that wasn't as fully formed in David's day. However, We'll see here in just a moment. In fact, let's go ahead and go there. We'll, we'll see that Jesus makes that connection. Okay? Watch this. Mark 12. Okay, this is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I like the, the version in Mark. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. Now, why did Jesus ask this? Well, the Pharisees were trying to trick him, trap him at the time to get him to say something. And this, this is the question he asked to put them at the end. But he's also teaching. What is he teaching? Well, it was common knowledge that the Messiah would be a son of David. That was part of the, that was part of the Davidic covenant. He was going to establish the throne of David forever. The only way to do that is this Messiah. Now, what they thought Messiah was, a political leader, a guy riding on, the right, on, a, white, riding on a white horse, going to take over, going to take charge, going to break them out of bondage from Rome. I think they had a very um, 
uh, human idea of Messiah, but nevertheless, the scripture makes it clear there's some very unique things about the Messiah. If he sits on the throne of David forever, he's eternal. Okay, so that's, that's a different topic for discussion. What's important here is that Jesus is establishing, listen, you say that he's the son of David. How is it David calls him Lord? Okay, so now Jesus is teaching. You know, we can, we can you know, here's, here, here's uh, God the Father. Here's God the Son. It's Jesus. And here's David. Uh, how is it? Well, I'm sorry, let's, let's do it like this. Okay, the Messiah is a son of David. But how is it David calls the Messiah Lord? The only way that David calls Messiah Lord is if the Messiah is greater than the king, greater than David. And it's because he is. So how, how can the Messiah be both the son of David and the Lord of David? Well, it's called the incarnation. That's how. He was born a son of David, but he was from eternity. He didn't begin in Bethlehem, did he? He, he existed. Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who? Jesus. He's God. He superseded all of this, yet the incarnation made him a descendant of David. Nevertheless, he's greater than David. And that's Jesus' point. Confounded the Pharisees. But that's the point that he's making. So David is just some of the previous verse. David is referring to the Messiah in some vague sense that he doesn't. It's not a specific thing, but that's who he's calling his Lord. No, he's 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 certainly referring to the Messiah, the one who will deliver Israel. Okay. He certainly knows that. Uh, and but Jesus is the one that brings clarity to it in, in this passage. Uh, verse 37, then he quotes, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So, you know, Jesus is using this to establish that there is something unique about the Messiah. And what is that? He's greater than David. He's greater than David. Now, why is that a good teaching point? Everybody else was looking for someone as a descendant of David, which would make him less than. The source is always greater. And he says, he, he brings this psalm out to, to show that. Now, we, we might think that Jesus was using this out of context, because I told you, this psalm is about war. This, this psalm is about the Messiah destroying his enemies. And everybody that was listening to Jesus that day knew that. Now, if you want to teach about the fact that the Messiah is greater than David, is it important that we understand how much greater? It is so, so very important. In fact, I'm a... I'm going to do so. I didn't plan on doing this or else I'd have had a pretty slide, but I'm going to do something here. Why is war important in this context? All right. This line represents all of time. All right. We're somewhere over here. I'm not going to put everything in here. I can, but I won't. All right. So this is going to represent back here. This is creation. We got Adam and Eve in the garden. We've got the, uh, the flood and Noah. You know, Abraham shows up and God gives a promise to him. I'm going to bless the whole world through you, right? But then a descendant of Abraham shows up and everything gets really, really specific suddenly. His name was, starts with him, Moses, right? Moses shows up and God gives him the, the law. Ten Commandments, law, whatever. So God is now working on earth through Israel under the law, and this is the standard of the day. Now, occasionally we see God drop into history and other nations, but that, those are minor things, and it's generally just to punish Israel for something. 
God's got to raise up the Babylonians, not because he, he hated the Babylonians. He raised them up to spank Israel, or Judah specifically. He raised up the Assyrians to spank Israel to the north. But anyway, basically everything is happening here. God is working through Israel under the law of Moses, and this goes on. Moses brought them out of Egypt. You remember the whole story. And then suddenly, Jesus shows up. And this is where we find ourselves today, this, this church age. Now, people have different ideas about the end times. Don and I were talking about this the other day. And Don will soon discover, I think, that I'm right. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and give you the right answer. I won't give you his answer, but... Scripture tells us that the Lord Jesus is going to come back for his church. We call this the, the rapture. And so we, in the rapture, the, the word rapture comes from a Latin word, which is a transliteration of a word that means to be caught up in the air. And this 1 Thessalonians 4 gets read at funerals a lot. Verses 13 through 18. I've read it at a lot of funerals. We just like to read that. Why? Because for the Christian it gives hope. Yeah, we just buried this guy, but there's coming a day when the Lord comes back that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the air and will meet the Lord in the air, and he takes us to heaven. So we call this the rapture. So I'll do a little up arrow here and a little down arrow loop going back, and that's Jesus and this is us, right? Now, after that time... Remember Revelation, remember our study of Revelation, we have a seven-year period on earth. Seven years. A tribulation. Now, where's the church? The church is up here. We just got raptured. In fact, this is, this is described as the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's wonderful. It's, it's, we're, we're finally reunited. Don't worry, there's no big screen showing all the things you did that we don't know about. Don't worry. You know, it says when, when we're with Jesus that we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that sounds terrifying, doesn't it? Because that word judgment. I remember the first time I heard that and I imagined the TV and, you know, Jesus doing like a John Madden. Here, here, and you did this. You know, it's like, oh, and everybody's seeing that, right? But the judgment seat, that's the Greek word bema. And a bema is a place of reward, not punishment. See, my sins were already paid for back on the cross. So you don't get to watch the highlight reel or the low light reel, as the case may be. You're just going to see me rewarded, and I'll see you rewarded for the good things done in your body. Okay, so that's where we are, down on earth, seven years of hell on earth, tribulation. Then we have what we refer to as the second coming. So forget the rapture just a moment. The cross is the first coming. The return of Jesus is the second coming. And this is ascribed towards the end of Revelation. But right here, right here at the end of this tribulation, I'm way ahead of myself. I've even got photos, got some visuals. But right here is the most famous battle of the final war. Bruce Willis is going to shoot an asteroid out of the sky, right? This is the Battle of Armageddon. It's actually in the Bible. It doesn't mean the end of all things. It refers to a battle in the valley of Megiddo, okay? And it's a battle when Christ returns and destroys all his enemies. We're with him, but I don't see us fighting. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us at all. And so after that, then we see the kingdom age. This is the kingdom, thousand years, Christ reigning and ruling on earth. Now, this is a way of understanding scripture. Not everybody agrees with this, but, you know, people will know someday that this is probably close. Anyway, we'll get to this. Now, why do I mention all this? Because I want you to understand when Jesus is here before the cross, he's under the age of Moses. Right? Jesus is offering himself to be the Messiah to usher in the kingdom. But what happens? Religious Israel rejects Jesus 
He turns away from Israel and he offers himself to the Gentiles, to anyone. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. My banquet will be full. And if the ones who are invited, Israel, doesn't want to show up, then I'll get the bums, the gutter trash, the guys on the street, the homeless, and I'll bring them into my kingdom. That's who we are, by the way. So he turns and offers himself to the entire world. He dies for the sins of the world. Now, he was going to die regardless, but if Israel had accepted him, he would have ushered in his kingdom. They rejected him. Now, with each of these ages in Scripture, we see that God had a rule of life, and man failed to live up to that rule, and God judged. You know, so when we look in the, in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> there was one rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And man had a failure. They ate. And God had a judgment. He kicked them out. And they were contaminated by sin. And then, he, and then they started living by their own conscience. So now they had the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, okay, then choose good. And what did they do? They chose evil. So God judged them. Sent the flood. Wiped out everybody. But he always leaves a little bit of hope. Yeah, he wiped out everybody but eight people, right? Noah and his family. And they came in and said, okay, we're going to set up human government. We know how that ended. Human government, they had, they had one thing to do. Scatter. Fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. And what did they do? They didn't scatter. They clumped together. And they said, let's build a tower and let's go up into heaven. And God judged them. He confounded the languages, forced them to scatter. And so then God turns and he focuses on a single people. Abraham builds Israel, brings in Moses, the law. And they've not fulfilled the law. The problem here is with this age under the law, there's one thing missing in this entire age. It got interrupted by the church. And that was judgment. There was never a judgment for the failure of Israel to follow the law. You say, wait a minute, they couldn't have followed the law. I know. I know. Just like we couldn't do that which was right back in the day. And we... We couldn't have a godly government back in the day. I know, we're doomed to fail. But there was never any judgment for the law. This time of tribulation is the time of judgment which belongs to this era. You see how neatly it works out. In fact, it was an exact appointed number of years, and there were seven years missing. Well, here they are. This is the judgment for this age. The church skips it, comes up here. Then we come back and go into the kingdom. But this... This tribulation and the end of it is the final nail in the coffin of this disobedient age. And so why is it so relevant? Why does Jesus bring this up? Well, he, he's bringing it up for a lot of reasons. One, he's trying to shut down his enemies because they're just playing. But he's also validating this truth. When the Messiah comes... It's the same Messiah, but we see him in two different ways, don't we? Who this this Messiah at the cross? You know, he's a suffering, suffering servant, right? He died for me. He died for you. He's the suffering servant. And who is he here when he comes back in the second coming? He's the conquering king. So we come to Psalm 110. Jesus authenticates it by quoting it. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke. Peter uses it as recorded by Luke in Acts. The writer of Hebrews uses it. They use it mostly to to verify and validate that Jesus is God. They use this to show that he is God. But we also have to understand that he is a God 
that came once and is coming again. He came once as a suffering servant, but how's he coming next time? He's not messing around. I, it drives me insane when people talk about, oh, the God of the Old Testament is so full of judgment, but the God of the New Testament is so full of love. Have you read Revelation? Same God. And there's a heck of a lot of judgment. There's going to be, well, I'll say there's a hell of a lot of judgment because it's hell on earth. And it's bad. And we'll see it. I'm, I say, keep saying we're going to see it, but I'm interrupting myself. Okay. Uh, and, and Jesus continued, David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened with delight. Okay, the second oracle is rule. Sit. Sit. Why? Sit until I send you out to subjugate your enemies. That's war. Now he says rule. Watch what he says here. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Verse 3, your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning womb. Okay, a couple things to unpack here. Let's go back to verse 3. Uh, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Zion was the uh, original name. Uh, it was the original location for the temple. And this, this is talking about representing that he's coming from the heart of his land into the enemy's land. You extend your scepter. Scepter is a symbol of his power and the fact that it's going forth. In other words, his power is not limited to Israel. His power is not limited to the Temple Mount. He says, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. So the idea that the power of the Messiah, you know, because we might, we might be tempted to say, well, he's a Jewish Messiah. That's their God. <laughs> no, he's going to rule in the midst of your enemies. His kingdom shoots forth into enemy territory, and he still has power. He's not limited by his own domain. He's not limited by his capital, so to speak. Uh, in verse 3, your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning womb. Uh, some poetic language here, but it's also very important because the king's army, the Messiah's army on that day is eager to serve. They're not conscripts. All right, we've all seen the news, right? The difference between people defending their holy, holy land, their homeland and conscripts of a foreign army that are being sent out to you know, kill people they don't know. We, 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 we know what it looks like when a, an unwilling army is sent into battle. They're useless. But the Messiah's troops will be willing on the day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. I, I believe this language is referring to those true believers who will go with Christ with all the energy and vigor. And this is kind of the idea here, like dew from the morning's womb. It, it could be saying, we don't really know here, but it could be saying that this is, these are the first to show up because dew comes early in the morning or it's they're, they're refreshed. You know, they come out there eager, willing, able. Uh, there's, no, there's no question who's going to win this battle. But what's important is to realize that the servants of the Lord, the followers of the Messiah, are true believers. No one on that day is going to have any hesitation about fighting for the king. Now, let's go back to the law of Moses just a minute. And notice the requirements of what it was to fight in, the, in God's army. Okay, Deuteronomy 20. I just want to read this. It doesn't need any commentary. Watch this. When you go to war against your enemy and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them. Because the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. When you're about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. He shall say, Hear Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic 
or be terrified by them. For the Lord, your God, is the one who goes for, with you to fight for you against your enemy, to give you victory. The officer shall say to the army, Has anyone built a new house and not begun to live in it? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else may begin to live in it. Has anyone planted a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else will enjoy it. Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else marry her. Then the officer shall add, is anyone afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home, so that his fellow soldiers will not become disheartened too. When the officers have finished speaking to the army, they shall appoint commanders over it. This is what it meant to fight for God. God doesn't have conscripts. That the army of the Lord are people that said, listen, there are no distractions. There, there are no... God, God, this army is not second place for me. Why? Because of their love for their Messiah. Because of their dedication to God and their absolute faith that it was He that would give them the victory. And so if anybody in the ranks doubted that or was distracted by anything else, they just go home. Just go home. Why? We don't need them. We don't need them. Now, what do we do with that? Are we going to be in that army? Well, yeah, it's quite possible. What does that look like? I have no idea. I'm going to read you a little bit later from that battle. And, uh, you know, I, I can't even imagine what it looks like. But what about between now and then, in this life, on this earth? I'm I'm of the opinion that this is the attitude we ought to have in our service to the Lord. Paul told Timothy that is also. And we're not to be in love with the world and be distracted by the world if God's called us to serve him. It's a tough challenge. All right, let's move on. We still got a lot to hit. And our third oracle is sacrifice. And this is going to take some, let me tell you, you're going to see why I called this the king as a priest, because this is going to impact us personally. But again, it still has to do with war. So follow with me in verse four, one verse on this. The Lord has sworn it will not change his mind. You are priests forever in the order of Melchizedek. So three oracles, sit, rule, and you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Again, contextually, who's talking to whom? David is listening and he's writing it down. The Father is talking to the Messiah, the Lord. All caps, right? Yahweh has sworn and will not change. You, the subject of his conversation, are a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek means uh, king of righteousness. Melchizedek was a first, per, a real person. We'll get to him in just a moment. This is the first time Scripture refers to this order of the priesthood. For Israel, they only knew one order of the priesthood. That was the order of Aaron, Moses' brother. Remember, when God gave the law to Moses, he raised up Aaron to serve as a priest. And the Levites came from him and became the priestly tribe of Israel. They had priestly duties. And they didn't own any land. They served in the temple and this was their role. But they were all Levites. Tribe of Levi. Once we come down through the sons of uh, Joseph, or, or, or Joshua. And, or excuse me, Joseph. We get the 12 tribes of Israel. We got Levi. And these are, the, this is the priestly tribe. Now, Jesus was of the tribe of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah. Yeah, when you get the whole phrase, it's easy to remember. He's not eligible to be an Aaronic priest, but that's actually good. Because the priests of Aaron, they made animal sacrifices over and over and over and over and over and over ad infinitum. 
because the, the sacrifice of an animal was offered for the atonement of sin. Atone literally means to cover over. Okay? This is like, um, now tikas don't do this, but I know you guys will be familiar with this. You're sweeping, you're sweeping, you got that rug there. You don't feel like getting the dustpan, you just kind of sweep it under the rug. You are atoning the dirt. You're covering it over with the rug. I, I atoned once when I was a kid. I, uh, my mom knows this now already. I, I kept it a secret for many decades, but um, I, I thought it'd be cool to launch a rocket out of the study when we were living in Colorado. I was into model rockets, and I just thought it'd be like, you know, those videos of the Trident submarine and the nuclear missile shooting up out of the sub? That's just cool. I thought, how cool would it be if a rocket shot out of the house? And uh, so I set up my tripod, and I put down a little little uh, protection everything and I got a kind of a mid-sized rocket put the engine in it the igniter three two one blast off and I it just missed it almost made it out the door but it caught the door frame ricocheted came back in and then just did this death spiral into the carpet um, putting a significant burn in into the carpet and I, I dove on it and flung it outside and 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 I look, and you know, carpet when it's heated has this horrible tendency to melt. Okay, um, there's no repair in that. So I atoned. And no, I didn't atone by going and telling my parents. I atoned by covering it up with a with a doormat. And, and it was so funny because like a couple years later, we're packing up and moving, and I hear my my dad pack. <laughs> Backing up the study, and he finds this spot in the carpet, and he begins cursing the uh, the floor mat. Look at this cheap piece of crap. You know that's what he said. I'm quoting, and he blamed the doormat for that. And um, I don't, he never knew the truth. But anyway, that's that's atoning. So, okay, that was way more than you asked, right? So the Aaronic priesthood made animal sacrifices to atone for sin. The Melchizedek priesthood was different. Okay, so let's get some context here. Uh, let's go back Hebrews Hebrews chapter seven. Okay, this is this is not what it looked like. I looked at so much artwork of uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. There was a great battle. Anyway, uh, Abraham came and presented offerings to Melchizedek. We'll read to this. It didn't look like this, but I thought that was cool. This is from fourteen twenty through fourteen seventy five, somewhere in there. Nice fifteenth century art. But uh, let me read this. This Melchizedek was king of Salem. Now, Salem means peace. That was the name of what is now called Jerusalem. Okay? So Melchizedek, king of righteousness, was the king over Salem, what would become Jerusalem. Coincidence? No. And he was priest of the God Most High. Now, understand... There was no law of Moses yet. This is during the time of Abraham. This is back here. There's no law of Moses. God has called Abraham to leave his family and to go to the land that he would show him. And so when we're reading through Scripture in Genesis, all we know is God communicates with Abraham. And then suddenly, after a great battle, Abraham meets Melchizedek, who knows God. And he's a priest and a king. Up until now, we've seen kings. We've seen priests. We've never seen a king who is a priest. Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. That story is in Genesis 14. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abraham saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Verse 20, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham, Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He tithed. Because the God of Abraham, the God of Melchizedek, same God. So what's unique here and why this is important is we have the union of, of the priest and the king in Melchizedek. And since, back to our psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, 
you're going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Meaning you're going to be what? You're going to be a king and a priest. And you're not going to be like Aaron. That's important. Okay? We go back to prophecy. We knew this would happen. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. Another reference to the Messiah. And he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne and he will be a priest on his throne and there'll be harmony between these two. These two what? Him being a king and a priest. What is the point of this? The Messiah would be an, an eternal priest which meant that the priesthood of Aaron would have to come to an end. Meaning the animal sacrifice would be done with. But it would take one sacrifice, one unique sacrifice, to finish it. And so the Messiah, we know now looking back, what did he sacrifice? Himself. Himself. The perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God offered by a priest out of the order of Melchizedek to cover the sins and no, I'm sorry, not to cover the sins of the world, to take them away. Jesus was not a Levite. He was from the tribe of Judah. So he was the new eternal high priest. So what happens? The cross is so important. A lot of people don't realize the day that sacrifice was made, that brought an end to the law. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill the law. Yeah, he gave a sacrifice that the law that superseded everything. Now, Hebrews explains this. I just want to read it. I'm not going to beat you to death with it. But notice Hebrews 7. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, and indeed the law was given to people established uh, that established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, Judah, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. He didn't inherit Mel the Melchizedek line. He defined it. Melchizedek was a, a foreshadow of what Christ would be because Christ was truly indestructible. Some people wonder, was Melchizedek? No, he died. We don't, have a, we don't have a record of his death, but that's on purpose. So we see the typology here, but he was just a man, whereas Christ was truly indestructible. In verse 17, for it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. Skip ahead to verse 27. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. What was the oath? <laughs> Psalm, I think it's Psalm 110, among others. You could take a lot of passages and apply to that. But what does he say in Psalm 110? I'm going to appoint you as priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's the oracle. That's the oath. Wow. I'm excited. You guys are fine. I'm, you know, I just, this is fun for me because I just, it's so, so perfect. So, so perfect. Okay, jump ahead, 8.13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. And it did. 
chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ is a mediator of the new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So everything that was sinful under the first covenant, which is all the fun stuff, right? All the stuff we like to do. Yeah. He dealt with it. He died as a ransom to set them free. It means we're free from the penalty and we're also free from the power. Though we may, on a stupid day, go and sin, because we like remember what it was like and like, oh, that would probably be good and it doesn't satisfy. We're set free from the power. We're not obligated to it. But we're most importantly set free from the penalty. Someday when we, are, when we meet Jesus, we'll, we'll be set free from the very presence of sin. It'll be gone out of our bodies. Now, so he does these three oracles. Watch this, I'm almost done. He does these three oracles, which are all about war. And in the final three verses, five, six, and seven, he tells the Messiah to wage war. <laughs> Watch this. The Lord, now, lowercase, Lord, right, not all caps, so Adonai, the Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Just go back to five and six. Very, I mean, you can't miss the imagery. He conquers. He conquers. And in the timeline of the life and ministry of Jesus, there's only two acts which might, would fit this. I mentioned the one here, this X here at the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. And at the end of the kingdom, you know, Satan is let loose for a little while. He gathers an army, but the description of Jesus putting that down is basically just fire from heaven. It doesn't, it doesn't fit this. Because who will gather in the valley of Megiddo? The kings of the earth. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. Who will attack Israel? Just about every nation. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. I think this is a direct reference, direct reference to this. Now, this verse 7 is a little curious. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Um, drinking from a, a, a brook is an image of refreshing, uh, invigorating. Um, I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how to take that, but if I, if I picture him coming in as a conquering king, Messiah, in the valley of Megiddo, and the fact that he stops and takes a drink, um, I don't know. That's a to me that looks like a strut. It, it's just a, such confidence and boldness. You know, he's been piling up the dead all day. Well, I need a drink of water and let's go. He's refreshed. His power. I don't know. I might be misreading that, but um, it's it's a beautiful beautiful image. And what does it refer to? I think Revelation sixteen sixteen. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, if you go there today. This is Tel Megiddo. You can tour this. It's a fantastic archaeological site. If you see, this is actually a very large tell. A tell is a mound that used to be, uh, well, it's a mound because there was a city, and the city got conquered, and they built the city right on top of the city. And that city got destroyed, and they kept building and building and building. And after a while, you've got a mountain here of ruins. And you can go, I mean, just stories down into this hill, in, the lower you go, the older you're getting back in time. One of the oldest cities on the planet. Some say 5,000 plus years old. Okay, 3,000 plus BC or, or even earlier. This is Megiddo. Okay. Uh, pagan city most of the time. Uh, Solomon probably had some stables here. You know, Solomon's stables. Uh, but if you stand up here and you look out, see here's, here's Tel Megiddo down here. This is the valley of Megiddo. Okay, so when, when scripture refers and revelation refers to this battle of Armageddon, this would be the location. Uh, these are farmers there now. 
There's a vineyard down there. Um, there's a little winery or, or wine store. I thought it'd be cool to buy wine in the Valley of Megiddo. I wasn't thinking it was my second day in Israel on my first trip. Had to carry that wine the rest of the time in my backpack. Where are you going to put it, right? That was heavy. Rookie move. Okay, never do that again. But I thought, you know, valley gets destroyed, the wine increases in value, right? But I don't have it. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, so that's where we're talking about. Now, I want to close with this. Let me just read from this battle. He, as Christ, Messiah, is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. You can go to Revelation 19 and read the rest of that story. But he wins. Our king is a priest who sacrificed himself. And that act of mercy and grace can cause people to misunderstand and forget that he is a holy and righteous God. When he comes back, he will deal with sin in a way he's not done that before. And it's war. Not because he delights in destroying people. But because he's holy. And that's important to remember. It's important to remember. There is a place for war. We don't see it in wars among people. They don't understand that. But in God's kingdom, it's a righteous end to this age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look in your word. Thank you for the revelation of our, of our king, our Messiah, who's our great high priest, who will come back and conquer one day. Lord, if, if we are called upon to ride with him that day, may we ride with boldness, unafraid, confident in his every move and in his leadership. And Lord, until that day comes, may we be confident and quick to ride with him in this spiritual war that's being fought on this earth right now. Never, un, never ashamed, always proclaiming that he is our king. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.